We saw in the previous section of the lecture on Thomas Cranmer that the broad position of the Church of England in the time of the Reformation was a receptionist position, which is to say the body and blood of Christ are truly present to the believer who receives the sacrament of the bread and the wine, uh, but not necessarily within the bread and the wine themselves. Uh, this position is taken up by Richard Hooker, um, and yet whereas Cranmer had uh, a number of areas where he left behind loose ends and there was a, a fair measure of imprecision and fuzziness, we see Hooker bring some clarity and finer distinctions uh, to play within his Eucharistic theology. So while Hooker repeatedly and explicitly disavows the kind of prying curiosity people uh, and theologians especially have for the manner of Christ's presence in the Eucharist, he says uh, it's for the satisfying of our empty souls and not for the exercising of our curious and subtle wits, he nevertheless does offer a good deal of precision and clarity where Cranmer previously did not. So he follows the main line of Cranmer's receptionism, but he goes beyond Cranmer in two respects, which is where I want to focus uh, in this section of the lecture. Uh, first, he very clearly assigns an instrumental role to the elements of bread and wine. And second, he situates Holy Communion within the context of a Cyrillian Christology, that is a Christology that is indebted to uh, the early church father, St. Cyril of Alexandria. And I will articulate in the course of this section of the lecture what that means and why that is significant. So whereas, whereas Cranmer uh, established a broad receptionist position with a fair measure of loose ends, Cranmer comes and he ties up those loose ends and then takes this receptionist position and he situates it in uh, one of the most stunningly beautiful takes on Christology that I think the church has yet, to, has produ yet produced, which is that of St. Cyril of Alexandria. Let's first look at Cranmer, uh, Cranmer, Hooker's position uh, and see uh, you know, what is his position and how he um, clarifies what role the bread and the wine actually play. It's an instrumental role, he will say. So as we've done with uh, Cranmer, so with Hooker, we'll go through the various features of uh, his uh, theology point by point uh, and allow uh, the, the clarity of his position to make itself uh, known. First, Hooker affirms the receptionism that is now taught by the Church of England, according to which Christ is present not in the elements themselves, but is truly present in the heart of the worthy recipient. He writes, the real presence of Christ's most blessed body and blood is therefore not to be sought for in the sacrament, but in the worthy receiver of the sacrament. So merely because the Church of England at this time was denying that the real presence was in the bread and the wine does not mean that the Church was denying the real presence. Rather, the real presence was in the believer feeding spiritually on the body and blood of Christ um, and not uh, in the elements themselves. But it's still a, a real presence position. Second, uh, Hooker argues that the proponents of consubstantiation, the Lutherans, and transubstantiation, the Romans, agree with the main emphasis of reception, which is the spiritual nourishment provided by union with the life-giving flesh of Christ. So regardless of what more speculative position one takes regarding Eucharistic presence, whether that's consubstantiation or transubstantiation, the, the final effect is the same the nourishment of our souls on Christ's life-giving flesh, um, which is a key component of our, Hooker's argument. He says, if, if receptionism secures the same spiritual benefit and the same uh, spiritual presence of Christ as consubstantiation and transubstantiation, why do we need these more speculative theories? Uh, at least so goes his argument. He writes, 
but seeing that by opening the several opinions which have been held, they are grown for aught I can see on all sides at length to a general agreement concerning which concerning that which alone is material or important, namely the real participation of Christ and of life in his body and blood by means of this sacrament. In other words, uh, regardless of all the arguments that's happening, can't we all agree, isn't there a general consensus that the most important matter, the material matter here, is the real participation we have with Christ uh, and our real union with the life that comes by means of uh, comes in his body and blood by means of the sacrament. Isn't that what matters above all? Receptionism, as well as transubstantiation, as well as consubstantiation, secures that point. He goes on. Whereof should the world continue still distracted and rent with so manifold contentions, when there remaineth now no controversy, so, saving only about the subject where Christ is? Yea, even in this point, no side denieth but that the soul of man is the receptacle of Christ's presence. So whether Christ inhabits the bread and the wine or not, or changes the bread and the wine into uh, the substance of his body and blood or not, the, the destination of Christ's presence is the soul of the believer. And so why are we being rent apart by controversy on matters that are merely speculative? We're arguing about where we locate that presence, but we all agree that we need that presence, and indeed we get that presence of Christ's body and blood within the sacrament. Uh, Hooker has a sort of pragmatic sensibility here. Um, um, he affirms the deep theological truths of the church, but he's disinclined to get drawn into uh, merely speculative and rarefied debates. Uh, some of us might resonate with, with that uh, tack of Richard Hooker. Third, Hooker interprets the words of institution uh, as suggesting that the elements are the instrumental cause of our sharing in Christ's body and blood. In other words, when Jesus took the bread and said, this is my body, and he took the the wine is, or the cup, and he said, this is my blood. What he is suggesting is these are the means by which you share in the reality of my body and blood. They are the instrumental cause of our sharing in Christ's flesh and blood. So recall, Cranmer left this as a loose end. He never specified exactly what role the elements play in our real communing with Christ's body and blood. Hooker does. He says these are the means by which that mystical sharing in the body and blood occurs. So he writes, uh, this is my body means, in effect, this hallowed food through concurrence of divine power is in verity and truth unto faithful receivers, receptionism, instrumentally a cause of that mystical participation, whereby as I make myself wholly theirs, so I give them in hand an actual possession of all such saving grace as my sacrificed body can yield, and as their souls do presently need. This is to them and in them my body. So, uh, for Hooker, the, body, the, the, the bread and the wine may not be literally uh, the, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, and that presence of his body and blood may not be in the elements themselves, contained within them, uh, but because they are the instrument by which we now share spiritually in the body and blood of Christ, for all intents and purposes, this bread and this wine is to them and in them my body and blood. So there's an instrumental uh, role that the bread and the wine play. As he goes on later in that same uh, section of the laws of ecclesiastical polity, the bread and the cup are his body and blood because they are causes instrumental upon the receipt whereof the participation of his body and blood ensueth. 
So in a unique way that goes beyond your communing with Christ uh, in your time of prayer, communion through by means of receiving this bread and wine gives you a mystical participation and a real sharing in Christ's own body and blood. So really, you know, Cranmer, uh, Hooker, uh, says he's not going to engage in curious and subtle use of wit. Um, he's not going to get in, drawn into speculative matters, but think how much clarity and precision he's brought to this. One, he says we, we do have uh, the real presence of Christ's body and blood that is not located within the bread and the wine, but by means of the bread and the wine, we share in that body and blood. There's a, a great deal of precision here that leaves... A mystery, yes, but it doesn't leave many further questions to be asked. So we have here a, a mystery uh, rather than a problem. You know, problems are there to be solved. Mysteries are there to be contemplated. Uh, Cranmer solves all the problems, thus preserving the mystery of Holy Communion. Um, if you can't tell, I find this a very persuasive position, um, very satisfying intellectually at any rate. Well, I've covered the instrumental role uh, assigned to the elements of bread and wine, uh, which is the first way in which, Cran uh, which Hooker has gone beyond Cranmer uh, and offered more precision and clarity. Let me now go on to the second. I suggested that uh, Hooker did, does a better job than Cranmer of situating Holy Communion within the larger Christological question. And what Hooker offers is uh, a Cyrillian Christology that renders Holy Communion um, uh, clearer and, um, um, well, he gives a rendering of Eucharistic theology that situates it in a, a beautiful and profound Christological vision, which is that of Cyril of Alexandria. Here I go back into earlier sections of the Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity in Book 5. You will read these sections in a few weeks, uh, but since you haven't read them yet, I brought them into this lecture in order to better make the point that I want to make. Um, as you notice, we, we're getting a lot of Richard Hooker, uh, more this year than in previous years. Um, that, of course, is, is by design. Hooker's Christology 5, or number 4, rather. Hooker's Christology, developed earlier in Book 5 of uh, the Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity, is explicitly indebted to St. Cyril of Alexandria. Now, let me talk about the Christology of Cyril just briefly. Uh, Cyril's calling card, so to speak, is um, an emphasis on two things. First, on the unity of human flesh with the divine person of the Son. So he emphasizes the unity of Christ, whereby uh, in the incarnation, human flesh is brought into a perfect union and unity with uh, uh, his divinity. Such that in this union, that human flesh is sanctified and transfigured uh, deified even and made life-giving so it's it's still human flesh just like our human flesh however in this hypostatic union in the union of the incarnation whereby Christ assumes this human flesh he transfigures it and he sanctifies it and he renders it life-giving he imbues human flesh with the life of God himself Okay, that's the first emphasis. The second follows directly from it. For Cyril of Alexandria, our sanctification is the effect of our union with that life-giving flesh of Christ. Rather than union with bare divinity, Cyril is not interested so much in union with merely God or bare divinity. Rather, he's interested in union with God by being unified with that transfigured, deified flesh of Christ. So it's as if for Cyril, what matters is the, 
this flesh of Christ, which we share in, has been rendered life-giving. And so then when, when we're un, united to that flesh, the life of God comes to us. So that flesh is the wellspring of eternal life for Cyril. So our salvation itself depends upon our union uh, with Christ's own flesh. And what Cyril will point out is that that's what Paul means by the body of Christ. What is the body of Christ? Well, it is that company of people who have been unified uh, to Christ's own body such that we become knit into him as members of his body. Uh, so there, this is a real and this is a vivid uh, union with Christ's own flesh. So twofold emphasis. Uh, Christ's sanctification and transfiguring of human flesh within uh, the unity of his person in the incarnation, and then our sanctification coming from our union with the fleshly Christ uh, as we come into contact, so to speak, with that life-giving flesh that has uh, the presence of God filling it and transfiguring it and transforming it. So it's as if what Christ has done to his own flesh, by union he does to us. He transfigures us and transforms us within a real union within it, with himself. Okay, with that in mind, how does Hooker incorporate this? Well, he incorporates this explicitly. He, he explicitly points out that he is, in his Christology, Cyrillian. He says, These things St. Cyril duly considering, reproveth their speeches, which taught that only the deity of Christ is the vine whereupon we by faith do depend as branches. In other words, unity with bare divinity. Again, uh, uh, Cyril's not interested in bare divinity. That does us no good. That doesn't save us. What he's interested in is Jesus Christ in the flesh. And that neither his flesh nor our bodies are comprised in this resemblance. For doth any man doubt that even from the flesh of Christ our very bodies do receive that life, which shall make them glorious at the latter day, and for which they are already accounted parts of his blessed body? Our corruptible bodies could never live the life they shall live, were it not that here they are joined with his body, which is incorruptible, and his in ours as a cause of immortality, a cause by removing through the death and merit of his own flesh that which hindered the life of ours. Christ is therefore both as God and as man that true vine, whereof we both spiritually and corporally are branches. So both spiritually and bodily we are actually knit into Christ himself. So that when Cranmer, when Hooker talks about participation in Christ or adoption in Christ or union with Christ, he's talking about uh, a union with uh, the fleshly Christ uh, and holding on, clinging to the life-giving, deified flesh of Jesus Christ, whereby we ourselves are transformed even as the flesh of the Son of God has been transformed by the presence of the divinity within it. What a beautiful Christological vision, and how Christocentric this is, do you see? Um, we can't be interested in God unless we're interested in Christ. And we don't have God unless we have Christ. We don't have Christ unless we have his flesh. Uh, Hooker goes on um, in that same section a little bit later. Thus much no Christian man will deny that when Christ sanctified his own flesh giving as God and taking as man the Holy Ghost, he did not this for himself only, but for our sakes, that the grace of sanctification in life, which was first received in him, might pass from him to his whole race, as malediction came from Adam unto all mankind. So how do we get the sanctification in life uh, that we need for our salvation? We get it by union with Christ in his very flesh. That is Cyril of Alexandria's theology. What does this have to do with Eucharistic theology? Well, everything. A Eucharistic theology is just a simple extension of this kind of thinking. What do we need for our salvation? Christ's flesh. What do we get in Holy Communion? 
by means of the bread and the wine, we receive a share in Christ's flesh and blood. So as with Calvin, uh, you can look at the notes and see Calvin makes a very similar move to Hooker, um, where he situates sacramental theology within a Cyrillian Christology. As with Calvin, Hooker's sacramental theology is a simple development of the Cyrillian idea that the sanctified and transfigured flesh of Christ is the wellspring of our salvation. He writes, This is therefore the necessity of sacraments, that saving grace which Christ originally is, or hath, for the general good of his whole church, by sacraments he generally he severally deriveth into every member thereof. Sacraments serve as the instruments of God to that end or purpose. Uh, don't you love how he says that? The grace which Christ is, so or hath. Uh, Hooker's not interested, interested in anything Christ can give us apart from himself. Uh, it's rather the grace that we need is the grace which Christ himself is. And so what we need is the self-gift of Christ, not some other gift from Christ. Do you see that? This is, again, in keeping with the Christological focus of salvation in Hooker's theology that we saw last week. So, by means of the sacraments, the grace which Christ is, right, he has, by means of the divine life that he has, transfigured his own flesh, uh, by the sacraments, he gives that grace to us, deriveth it into us. Um, Hooker says. So the, the sacraments are the instruments by which God does that. Number six. Going beyond Calvin, again, you can look at the notes. For Calvin, um, the bread and the wine were not instrumental causes of our communion with the body and blood of Christ, but rather the visible sign or seal of that real union uh, with Christ's body and blood. So going beyond Calvin, Hooker claims that the bread and wine of Holy Communion are the instruments used by the omnipotent God. I just lost my place. Uh, to unite us to the heavenly, life-giving flesh and blood of Christ. So the bread and the wine here are the instruments by which this life-giving union with the life-giving flesh of Christ is affected and made real. So he writes, Content we ourselves with St. Paul's explication. My body means the communion of my body. My blood means the communion of my blood. Is there anything more expedite, clear, and easy than that this, than that, that, that excuse me, than that as Christ is termed our life, because through him we obtain life, so the parts of this sacrament are his body and blood, for that they are so to us who receiving them, Receive them, receive that by them which are termed. Wow, I did not do well with that sentence. Uh, Hooker's prose is beautiful, but it is challenging. Let me try that one more time. Is there anything more expedite, clear, and easy than that as Christ is termed our life, because through him we obtain life, so the parts of this sacrament are his body and blood, for that they are so to us who, receiving them, receive that by them which are termed. Uh, what's he saying here? What he's saying is Christ is called our life itself because by him or through his flesh we receive the life of God. So also the bread and the wine are called the body and blood of Christ because through them we receive the body and blood of Christ. And so it, as Hooker will say elsewhere, no he says it here, um, Every cause is in its effect uh, truly. So if the effect, you, if a cause uses an instrument to create a certain effect, then the cause is in the instrument. So if um, God causes us to have a share in the body and blood of Christ in the instrument of bread and wine, that means his body and blood are in the bread and the wine, so to speak. It's a complicated metaphysics, but it works out. You can take my word for it, or you can figure out how it works. The bread and the cup 
Hooker goes on, are his body and blood because they are cons causes instrumental upon the receipt whereof the participation of his body and blood ensueth. Every cause is in the effect which groweth from it. Our souls and bodies quickened to eternal life are the effects, the cause whereof is the person of Christ. His body and blood are the true wellspring out of which this life floweth. So there we have that Cyrillian Christology, that the, the wellspring of eternal life is nothing other than the flesh and blood of Christ and the means by which we are united to that flesh and blood and enjoy the real presence of that flesh and blood are the bread and wine of Holy Communion. So here is a receptionist position, yes, but have you noticed how it has a sort of Catholic depth to it? It's a Reformation position, a Reformed position, and yet it is not without uh, the depth of tradition, especially in the... Uh, the, through the voice of Cyril of Alexandria, uh, undergirding it and rendering it um, uh, profound and persuasive. Conclusion. While the Reformation debates over the Eucharist are often depicted as fuzzy and imprecise in nature, especially the English church's contribution to those debates, there's some truth to that, the history suggests otherwise. Cranmer had his small measure of fuzziness, but overall, the Church of England took a clear position on the matter of Eucharistic presence at the time of the Reformation. In Cranmer's day, here's what this meant, an affirmation of the real presence of Christ's body and blood in the worthy receiver of the sacrament. And then in Hooker's work, this receptionist position flowered into a sustained Cyrillian theology of our participation in the life-giving flesh of Christ through the instrumental efficacy of the sacramental signs of bread and wine. So at the conclusion here, I would suggest that for the next 200 years of Anglican history, after the time of Hooker, it is Hooker's sacramental theology and Eucharistic theology uh, that, uh, that carries the day within Anglicanism and becomes the, the gold standard. Um, of Anglican Eucharistic piety. And moreover, here is what Hooker has vindicated, the Christological question, not just rarefied matters uh, regarding presence in bread and wine, uh, real presence and all of these kinds of things, uh, but rather the Christological question, how is Christ present to the church today? What Hooker uh, managed to articulate in his Eucharistic theology is, is this, Christ is present to the church in his very life-giving flesh, making that available for union and participation that will then transfigure and transform us sinful human beings. Well, I hope you uh, enjoy the reading for this week. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to ask, and I look forward to our conversations together. Goodbye.